Hello, and welcome to updates on the survey strategy for 2023. <laughs> um, so I, I'll introduce myself. I'm Lynn Jones. I'm the lead scheduler scientist. And um, my co-chair today is Federica Bianco. She's the survey cadence optimization committee chair. Um, you'll hear more about our groups in just a second. We also have Peter Yochum, who's going to talk today, and um, we'd like to give a shout out to all the members of the SEOC. Um, and right now, I'm going to remind you about the code of conduct, uh, in particular, um, the kindness and non-harassment. And let's all remember to be very kind to each other. This is Cadence Diplomacy, after all. Um, and make sure you're, you're giving other people their space as needed. Um, we do have remote participation today. So there are people on Zoom. Um, hello. If you're on Zoom, um, we're happy to take questions. We do have somebody monitoring the Zoom um, chat, but please actually don't ask your questions there. If you would ask them in Slack, that would be better. Um, and our Slack channel is, uh, oh, you corrected it. Thank you. Thank you, Fed. Is, is at the bottom of this slide. Yeah, I was, yeah, very good. Okay. So today in our session, we're going to have a brief introduction to the SEOC and the SST. We'll talk about what our current baseline survey strategy is. And then we'll talk about the current SEOC activities and what they're going to be doing from here to operations and then throughout operations. Um, and I'm sure that that is an area that a lot of you have questions about, like how are we going to keep making sure we evolve the survey strategy in a way that is responsive to the community. So first I'm gonna take a second to introduce the survey scheduling team. So we're the project side of the scheduling work. There's myself, Lynn Jones, um, Peter Yochum out here, um, Eric Nielsen, and uh, we have a future member to be joining us, Rice Comback. So the interesting thing about our group is that we are a mix of construction and operations uh, personnel at the moment, and eventually we will be transitioning into operations. So we are, and what we're doing is building the brain of the scheduler, that's the feature-based scheduler part of the scheduler, um, and evaluating survey strategy options. So that's been the primary bulk of our work so far. And we're also building tools to monitor survey progress during operations. So this is like what we're ramping up with in our operations phase. And there was a little movie here, which I don't know if I can replay again, but just a little, little uh, movie of like, Um, just as sort of a demo of some of our tools we're building for the operation stuff, since I know you've already seen a lot of our uh, stuff for construction. Okay, Fed's going to talk about the SEOC. Yes, we're going to do a bit of switches of microphone during this talk, so bear with us. So yes, I wanted to introduce, reintroduce uh, the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee, uh, it's new and old members. I wanted to acknowledge them and thank them one more time. This work, this group has a fairly significant amount of work for a committee um, that is acting on a volunteer basis and they've demonstrated continuous dedication and they're just basically untireable and unflappable and I want to thank them all. Some of them are here, so maybe you want to get up and let people know who you are. That'd be great. And I won't read all the names out loud, but um, you see them here. And also you see that each one of them is linked to a science collaboration. Uh, we have liaisons between the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee and the science collaboration. Most science collaborations have even more than one liaison. And those are your points of contact if you are in a science collaboration. But of course the committee is open to um, discussions and feedback and solicits your input, even if you're not in a science collaboration and you can reach out to us um, finding the contact on our website. I um, just 
want to give you a sense of what the work is. The SCOC meets at least monthly in periods of significant activity and as deadlines approach, we meet more, possibly more than monthly. So for example, last year when we were writing the um, phase two recommendation document that was released in December, um, as I mentioned, we have liaisons in the science collaboration. We also have instituted a monthly office hour um, at 7 a.m. Pacific on the last Monday of the month. You are welcome there. There is a link here to a form that makes sure that we know that you're going to be there so we pay attention to the Zoom link. But we're there even if there is nobody every month. And uh, we have monthly minutes, uh, monthly meetings, and the minutes for the meetings are available to the community um, on community, our forum. Um, we also typically hold a workshop uh, traditionally that happened in November, it's likely to happen again this November, we probably will focus on the task forces, um, and it's always a virtual workshop to maximize accessibility. Um, and I think, yes, one other thing that I wanted to highlight before we get to um, the topics that Lynn mentioned before, and we tell you about the new um, the recommendations and the survey cadence itself, is that a lot of the work really has been on your shoulder, on the shoulders of the community. So you're really the protagonist of this story over even um, the, if I may, the survey um, cadence team and the survey cadence optimization committee. Um, and the community has contributed a, an almost uncountable number of pieces of work uh, in various forms, white papers, cadence notes, just reports that you send back to us, to the committee. Um, and a lot of them have been collected in this APJ supplement focus issue of Rubin. And I think it's really neat that Rubin has a focus issue, you know, a couple of years before survey start. That's quite a unique, um, that's quite a unique privilege. And it already has 18 papers. There's 11 that I know of that are either under review or in preparation. And the, so the focus issue will remain open. Submissions are on a rolling basis. Um, it will remain open until we finalize the survey recommendation and we have a template for starting the survey um, in 2025. So if you wanna submit a paper, if you wanna know more about it, the steps for submitting the paper are highlighted here. If you wanna know more about it, reach out to me. And I wanna acknowledge that Chris Lento is the editor um, that uh, this focus issue is assigned to, that he has really vision um, and passion to support this project. So I wanna acknowledge Chris and I also wanna acknowledge the Heisen Simons Foundation that has supported a lot of the papers that have been submitted through a grant that Rachel Street has PI'd. That grant unfortunately has run out. So we cannot support your future publications, um, but it's been invaluable to get a lot of this off the ground. See, we work very closely with the SEOC. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to, depending on when you have tuned in about the survey strategy, you may have seen something that was closer to V1 there on the left, um, or you may have seen something somewhere between there, like at V2 or our most recent um, release, V3. So we wanted to point out that the last five years have brought quite a few changes. The footprint has improved quite a bit for extragalactic science. So we have more area in low dust sky. We have an improvement of cadence on short time scales because we have adopted a, what we call a rolling cadence throughout um, the main parts of the survey. So what that does is it sort of focuses on parts of the sky in one year and then like defocuses those parts of the sky the next year. So you have a slightly higher cadence and then a slightly lower cadence. There's no free lunch. So you just, you, you kind of trade off when you're getting the visits. Um, the general science metrics are improved. However, it is worth noting that the overall number of visits per pointing um, has dropped in the white fast deep as a result of this, this change. And that's because we have done this work to change the footprint. We've directed foot, uh, visits to things other than the traditional wide fast deep. We have a more uh, widely uh, distributed, I guess you could say survey as a result, we have an overall improvement in our science metrics. 
but it does mean that our number of visits per point thing is a little bit lower than it was way back then in V1. And we are now at V3.2 of the survey strategy. So what have we, how have we gotten to this point? So if you want to learn more about the details of how we went from V1 to V2 to V3, I recommend you go and have a look at the SEOC recommendations, which are written up in, uh, oh, I think uh, we, we had a little uh, uh, spacing problem here, but in PSTN 053 and PSTN 055. And if you, are familiar with the LSST document ecology? Those are PSTN, uh, PSTN 055.lsst.io, for example. So the highlights from those recommendations are that we have that change in the footprint coverage, um, that we use the rolling cadence, we increase the time spent on deep drilling fields, and we're adding one early microsurvey. That's the near sun twilight microsurvey. And we're also adding a small fraction of revisits to the same pointing that was observed earlier in the night in a pair at sort of a two to seven hour time interval. And that only happens on some nights. Um, they're actually quite fairly rare, but that does happen. And that helps our sh very short time scale science. All right. Um, oh, sorry, I do have one more slide. Uh, and so the uh, baseline survey strategy evolution, these are just some very high level metrics, just a very small fraction of what we look at. Um, up in the top left uh, and on the left, you see metrics where we're plotting them with some error bars. Those error bars come from a range of simulations where we run with a different weather setup. So those, those bars are, they, you can see the little legend, one sigma wet weather variations. What that is, is just when we run with a variety of weather, we see this metric can vary by that much. So you can think that's probably somewhat close to what our error bar in that metric ought to be. So you can see the number of visits and you can see how that dropped at V3 because that's where we started directing these visits to other places. But it's still, you know, if you look at those error bars, there's still um, quite a range. Also, that we're still above the SRD minimum. So please remember that. So can I read the, the caption on the, on the arrow? The arrow just says better. So the metrics are all better towards the top of the plot. Oh, you, the, and the little legend says one sigma weather variation. And the y-axis, the big label, we have on the left, top left is number of visits. The next one is proper motion. And the, and the bottom one is parallax. And if you can't read the, the label on the axis, I'm sure you can't read the numbers, but they are in the slides. And, and um, yeah, so yeah. Um, and those are our core SRD metrics. And so the main point here is we are keeping an eye on them. Um, the number of visits is still above the minimum SRD visits. And on the right, you see, this is a very high level subset of metrics. And it's just showing the fractional change in these metrics across this series of baselines. So the fact that you see more blue towards the right-hand side of this as we're going further over towards V3.2 is, a, is a generally a good thing. Now, what you don't see on that fractional change is the error bars. And for some of these, the error bars are fairly large. So any one of these, if, you, if you're like, oh, I actually, I'm curious about that, it's better to dive into what the actual individual metric looks like in a plot like those on the left, but I just don't have space or time to go through all of those today. Okay. So now Peter is going to talk to us about the V3.2 baseline and some of the specific things that are implemented in this. Okay, hey, hi everybody. Um, let's talk about our latest simulations and what's going on with them. Okay, so very brief introduction. Here's what our simulation looks like. After 10 years, we've got 2.1 million visits on the sky. Uh, and so here I'm showing it in RA deck space. And here's what the distribution of pointings looks like in alt as space. So we do avoid Zenith like we're supposed to. And then this very busy plot is just showing the first year for every night color coding by what filter we're in. And so you can see 
we change filters a lot and there's some nice regularity where you see some reddish stripes that's full moon where we're more in the red filters and then you know when it's new moon we tend to be in the bluer filters so that's that's the high level what the end of the simulation looks like uh, most telescopes have proposals and you know each observation is set for a science goal we don't do that we have observing modes and each mode is almost always doing multiple science goals at, at one time so what i'm laying out here is the different modes of observing we go through so our main mode is what we call pair 33 that's where we pick a large region on the sky image it switch to a neighboring filter image it again and those should be separated by about 33 minutes and that's taking up 74 percent of our exposure time and then if we don't have a full 66 minutes we'll go and do pair 15 which is the same thing only doing a 15 minute pair and that's another 10 percent of our observing time the deep drilling fields are 6.7 percent of the exposure time so that's the those five five favorite fields that we have the long gaps that lynn mentioned that's where we're intentionally trying to sample uh time scales of two to seven hours if we don't force the survey to do that it'll observe a large chunk of sky and not come back to it the same night so uh previously we really didn't have any coverage of that time scale so that's uh we're using about four percent of our time to make sure we sample those uh, the greedy algorithm is basically our fallback. If we can't, don't have time to do anything else, we'll just pick observations one at a time across the sky. We won't try to pair them. We won't do, won't do anything else. So that tends to be uh, twilight time, or if a deep drilling field is scheduled, uh, we'll do some greedy observations to kill time before the DDF starts. And then our newest addition is the near sun quads. In uh, twilight time, we'll take one by 15 second exposures in twilight very near the sun to try to get inner inner solar system objects objects interior to venus and so that's shaving off kind of the the least popular one percent of time because it's bright twilight time all right some of the updates uh we've increased the the ddf fraction compared to, to earlier versions uh especially in the cosmos field because cosmos is off by itself uh we want to go extra deep on cosmos so we can get the the full 10-year coedition early in the survey so we'll know, you know if we need to change something, say our dithering strategy, we can know that early on uh, before we go to the full depth of all the other fields. Uh, we've got that new near sun survey. Uh, we've got our new gaps and then our latest additions. We've updated the start date of our simulations to May 1st, 2025. Uh, we've added a little tiny swath uh, that the Euclid consortium said, oh, we're gonna cover that. Can you cover that too? Uh, so we've added a little swath for Euclid. Uh, one of the changes, because our filter wheel can only hold five filters at a time, and we have six. Uh, previously, we were taking U out in bright time uh, and swapping it with Y, swapping, excuse me, swapping with Z. Now we're gonna swap it with Y. Uh, and that was just a historical, very, very early simulations always took Y in twilight time. And now we're doing more filters in twilight time. So we don't need Y all the time. And uh, supernova science really liked not having large gaps in Z coverage, so. We can swap that. Uh, let's see. Well, we there were some and other bug fixes. All right. Uh, here's showing how the deep drilling fields have changed, uh, and this is just showing number of visits in the the newer simulations compared to the old ones. And you can see Cosmos has a lot more observations now because we're intentionally getting that ten year depth early. Uh, here's a little refinement that we made from V3 to. Uh, 3.2. This is the Altaz distribution of those uh, twilight observations looking for interior solar system objects, and we've refined it down, so we're going to even higher air mass and, and a much tighter distribution on those. We're not letting it wander up. Basically, earlier, we were taking these, and a lot of those were not discovering any objects at all. We need to, needed to tighten it up and, and make them actually useful. Uh, here's kind of the distribution in blue is all our regular visits, the solar elongation, and then in orange, these intentionally tightened up interior ones. And here's the, the distribution of those visits in RA deck space. And so you can see we are hugging the ecliptic, getting as close to the sun as possible. And this is probably the biggest science improvement we've seen for a while. Uh, this is just the, the fraction. We, the, the solar system collaboration, I'm not supposed to play favorites, so it's like kids, but this, the solar system collaboration is probably my favorite right now because <laughs> they said, we wanna observe these, these new objects. And I said, Great, give me a sample of them. So they gave us, you know, ten thousand orbits of theoretical objects, so we could go and 
change our survey parameters and say, how many do we recover? And you know, when we did our first pass, we went from 0% to 40%. And then this next jump is going up to 40% of the objects recovered. So this is my pitch of everyone should be like the, the solar system collaboration, give me a good metric, then I can really easily change the parameters and, and get you a lot of science out of it. But, but we need those, those theoretical populations first. All right. Uh, and here's an example of how we take those uh, triplets. So uh, these are some of the triplet observations in alt as space at the, uh, at the start of the night when twilight ends, we intentionally tip over, take a pair of observations at high air mass, and then wait several hours, and then get a third observation at that same spot. So these are triplets within the night, so you get some gaps in there. Uh, the RA dead coverage on this looks really weird because we don't have any constraints on how we should, you know, where people are interested in getting these gaps. So I think this can be refined a lot, but we need, we need better metrics to do that, to figure out, you know, where the, where the bonus is. Uh, and the, oh, and this is just showing a percentage of kilonova recovered by, you know, uh, by the, the ZTF criteria. Um, and so, and this is one where I don't understand this metric very well. I don't know, understand why it went up or down, but it's up overall, so that's good. Uh, all right. Uh, and then our little Euclid swath, here's our 3.0 uh, footprint. Here's 3.2, and if I blink back and forth, you can do, 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 you, you can see there's that little swath right there that we added on. So that was an incredibly minor addition, but um, it helps for Euclid. Uh, okay. Oh, and here we're talking about how we're now swapping uh, U out with, with Y instead of Z. Um, and when did that go down? Oh, well. Anyway, for the most part, uh, this really helps uh, the supernova 1A coverage, especially in the deep drilling fields, because now there are not large, you know, multi-day gaps in the Z-band coverage. So those high redshift supernova still get detected and, and we recover more of them. Uh, one last thing, oh, the little bug had crept up where in 3.0, this is in G-band. For the first year, there were some gaps. We didn't have full sky coverage. So we turned a knob and make, make sure we're still getting full band full sky coverage uh, and so we can build templates after year one. Uh, so here's my favorite radar plot, looking at how things have changed from 3.0 to 3.1. Uh, the point is Batira, that's those inner solar system objects, they're way up. Year one coverage in U and G is fixed, that's back up. Uh, the number of supernovae is way up because of that, leaving the Z band in. Uh, XRB early detection is up. Uh, th this is actually piggy piggybacking off of the, the near sun observations. I think that's where, where those are coming from. You can actually get some XRBs uh, from those observations as well. Uh, Trojan asteroids are down slightly. And I think that's just because the start date changed. And so the Trojans have drifted up into the North ecliptic spur and out of the wide fast deep. So there's not a lot we can do to, to save those. Uh, well, I guess we could delay another eight years, but we probably don't want to do that. So, uh, all right, that's the, the summary of our latest simulations. So now I think I hand it over to Fed. All right, so a reminder that we have the Slack open. So if you wanna ask questions, we'll of course have questions later from the people in the room as well. So um, I wanted to tell you about the current activities of the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee and the future plans for the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee and how it will work in operations. The SCOC is a standing committee of Rubin Observatory. So it will continue working throughout the 10 year of the survey, continue to improving and optimizing and uh, the survey strategy to achieve the best scientific goals. So uh, starting with PSTN 055, uh, the link for which is in the Slack, by the way. Um, we have um, converged on a number of parameters of the survey. We also have identified some specific key points that we were still working on and we still need to converge on. Um, there were nine, eight or nine, depending on how you count points that we were working on. And I'm gonna go through them and tell you which ones we are actually working on right now, which one we have solved and which one we will be working on in the future, starting with this one, which we have solved. As you have heard, we have um, 
after a round of simulations of the survey strategy, we now know that our best options is to swap the U um, and the Y filter, keeping the Z on the wheel. The Z filter therefore stays protected, uh, doesn't get swapped at all. And we also achieve the best science by our science metrics. So that's gone. Uh, two other points that we had highlighted that needed more work on are filter balance. So by filter balance here, I mean, do we want to consider changes in the exposure time per filter if we find out that the throughput of the survey is different from what we expect? But we can only find out that the throughput of different filters is going to be better or worse than we expected once we are on sky. So once we have that information of the complete throughput of the telescope system, then we will consider whether or not we want to put some more time in certain filters and others to balance changes in throughput from our expectation. We can't solve that until we have on sky time, so this will have to wait until post commission. Similarly, one big question that a lot of people keep uh, being curious about is whether or not we're going to keep the two times 15 second snaps for every exposure. So every exposure in the baseline is generated as a set of two exposures that are taken back to back, 15 seconds each. And this um, enables things like easy subtraction of cosmic rays, but we think we can get away with that with cosmic rays without doing this. So there is a possibility for swapping between two 15 seconds to one single exposure in 30 seconds. And because we take so many exposures over 10 years, that actually does add a lot, a fair amount um, of, uh, subtract a fair amount of time from, uh, from the survey. So add a fair amount of time to the survey. So we actually get an efficiency increase of 7% or thereabout. Um, that's a big consideration uh, that can improve all of the science metrics. There are other things that we're gonna think about once we know whether or not two times 15 or one times 30 is possible. Then we're gonna consider what is the other impact of this choice. For example, how does this change the saturation limit of the survey and what is the impact on science of doing that? So that's a decision that the a recommendation that the SEOC will make after commissioning, which leaves us with the following point that we are actively working on. So I'm going to go through each one of them, briefly reading them, uh, the uniformity of the coads in the, uh, having decided that we're going to operate in a rolling cadence, um, some refinement of the galactic plane and galactic bulge footprint, including filter balance optimization and field and footprint optimization, uh, the intranet cadence for the deep drilling fields, the target of opportunity strategy, and what we're going to do in early science, which here we really mean in year one, because the SCOC only works on strategy during the survey. So you can and think about that as year one of the survey. Um, we have recently asked the community once again to give us their input, uh, particularly to give us any update, if the updates, if they had them from earlier input. We've done that. We have provided a survey, um, a form to the community to tell us if there was anything specifically that they can highlight from previous work or that had changed from previous work that taps on these eight or nine points that we are still um, to converge on. And we got 14 responses uh, from various science collaboration. I wanna one more time thank the community for tirelessly working with us towards the optimization of the survey strategy. And here you see the breakdown of what the responses were about. So we got responses on all of the topics that we had solicited responses on. So that led us to form three task forces that are currently active. We have a task force on uniformity of the survey coads that has been active since mid spring. Uh, it's chaired by Rachel Mandelbaum. For each one of these task forces, you see the charge uh, in this slide. I'm not gonna read it word by word, but the uniformities of survey coads task force is thinking about in the presence of the rolling that has been recommended by the survey cadence optimization committee, which is in two skies at 0 0.9 strength, how does that impact the uniformity of the coads and the catalogs at data release? And how can we um, maximize the uniformity in the presence of coad with strategic choices on the, um, on the survey strategy? Um, the second task force that, I want, that we have activated is a multi-way strategy task force. It's co-chaired by Jay Strader um, and Rachel Street. Jay Strader is here. And this survey will converge on the filter balance for the footprint for the galactic footprint and some details of how the galactic footprint will be observed, including the, uh, we have largely figured out what the footprint itself is and how much time we spend on each piece of the footprint, but whether we wanna roll on that footprint the same way that we do in the wide fast deep, different way in some areas may, maybe, but not in others. 
and the deep drilling field strategy, which is chaired by Saurabh Jha. Um, and this will provide input and recommendations on what is the intra-night cadence for the deep drilling fields. Mind you, we have selected the deep drilling fields. There's five. Um, the last decision about the deep drilling fields, which is encoded in PSTN 055, is that the fifth field is the Euclid deep field south, and that that is observed as two separate uh, pointings, each observed to half the depth of the other deep drilling fields, but we still have questions about what is the alternation of filters uh, during an observing night in the deep drilling fields, how do we recover the sequences that might get interrupted, how do we prioritize, um, how do we prioritize um, recovery um, in field fields and in filters. So each one of these survey strategy exists and has members of the SEOC in it. And uh, for some of them, members of the community have fully been recruited. For others, members of the community are still in the process of being recruited. We have two goals when we form these, these task forces, uh, is to keep them uh, inclusive, because we always want to think about inclusivity uh, in Ruby in general and the SEO, in the SEOC in particular. So we want to make sure that anybody that wants to contribute to these decision um, can contribute to the decisions. We also want to make them agile, which means we do want to keep them to the people that are intending to contribute to the decision that have bandwidth, knowledge, and time to work with us. So they're relatively small, and we don't broadcast um, the, the communication patterns or the communication links. Typically, they work on Slack, so there is a Slack channel for each one of them. And if you think that you can contribute, if you're finding out about these, these task force now, and you think you can contribute, but you were not contacted by one of the SEOC members, uh, please reach out to us. We absolutely welcome people on these task forces while keeping them agile. Uh, the task forces have deliverable planned um, uh, in 2023 for the uniformity of COADS and Milky Way strategy task force by the end of the year. Uh, we expect them to give feedback to the SCOC so the SCOC can incorporate that feedback and update its recommendation. And a little bit later for the deep drilling fields, say quarter one of 2024. Uh, some discussions about some of these topics that include the members of the task forces already happened on Monday at the day one session on observing strategy and photometric calibration. Particularly, there was a discussion of the uniformity on the coads, as well as uh, some details of how to observe um, the galactic footprint. And I want to thank the people that organized, Peter, and participated in that, um, in that session, Eli and Loredana. Okay, so that leaves me with a couple of things uh, of those points. Uh, one is the target of opportunity. Um, the target of, of opportunity recommendation of PSDN uh, 055 is that Rubin shall have a target of opportunity program. That means even though Rubin is built as a survey telescope, uh, we will enable interruption of the survey to respond um, at this time to gravitational wave triggers. Uh, gravitational wave triggers, it, um, more in general, perhaps multi-messenger multi astronomy, but we're designing the target of opportunity program, thinking about gravitational wave triggers. And once we have it, it could be expanded to other multi-messenger astronomy or to other prior science priorities that will become uh, known as the survey evolves. Uh, we'll dedicate about 3% of the time um, to this program. And uh, we have encoded the possibility of expanding to other kinds of targets. What we don't know yet um, is how we will trigger, what gravitational wave triggers we will respond to, and how we will observe based on the characteristics of the trigger, what filters, what sequence of images, um, and how do we cover um, the, the footprint, the relevant footprint. So the SCOC is working to organize a community workshop to deliver a recommendation to the SEOC that then will formulate the recommendation to the director. Um, and uh, I've very recently, we have identified um, that we can host the workshop at Berkeley. Um, the constraint on where we wanna host it and how we wanna host it is really strictly financial. I just wanna make sure that it's an inclusive workshop and that it doesn't have a workshop fee that we can serve food to the people that come. And I'm working to get some travel funds uh, to support community members that couldn't otherwise participate. Um, so um, we wanna hold it at Berkeley because it meets some of these criteria. We have some uh, constraints on the day, but we're gonna try and set it up for uh, January of 2024. If not, it will shift to the summer of 2024 so that we can host it at Berkeley 
while classes are not happening. Uh, stay tuned, and I want to thank Igor Andreoni, who's putting a lot of work towards the organization of this workshop. If you come to this workshop, it will be a hybrid workshop. Uh, On-site participation will be limited by space, and we'll try to make sure that we have a team that is both diverse and knowledgeable. We'll have some people from Rubin uh, that can tell us what's possible and what's not possible in the observing strategy some people from the SCOC and a lot of people from the community, as many as we can fit within the financial and space constraints. Everybody else will be welcome to join uh, online and uh, there will be work to do. We will give you a template for a white paper, which we expect to be filled during the workshop. So it's, please come, but just be advised that you will have to work if you come. Um, and then there's early science. And so we're working with the Rubin um, operations team with the early science team, Leanne is here, um, on um, taking the input from commissioning and science validation and designing the best first year of the survey that we possibly can. There was already a session on early science. So I'm not gonna dwell on this very much, uh, but you know, uh, what we're gonna work on is finalizing the decision that I mentioned earlier, uh, that will come from knowledge of the commission, the knowledge from commissioning, and then figure out how we build templates that enable alerts and optimal coverage of the sky in year one. Of course, we recognize the value of the input that we have already received from various groups, including the Solar System Science Collaboration, the TVS Science Collaboration, and a few others uh, on how to prioritize templates and how to run the survey in year one. We will solicit more feedback. So if you have not given it yet, don't worry, we'll, we're gonna come and ask you and we'll consider all of these parameters to make the best recommendation for year one. What else? Um, right, so now, now we move on to how will the SCOC work during the survey? So um, there's a couple of things that I want you to think about, um, things that the SCOC might need to think about during operations. Um, Things that we'll definitely learn only on Sky are going to be details of the observing strategy for TOs. We right now go into the TO um, in the TO response with really only just one well-observed kilonova. As we discover more, we may tune that strategy. Um, and so this will be something that the SCOC will reevaluate continuously on an annual basis. Of course, we do think that Rubin is a transformational survey. Accordingly, we think that the, that the scientific priorities will change, the scientific landscape of Rubin will be changed and impacted by Rubin. So we will consider new scientific priority and whether the current survey strategy continues to support them, or if it needs tweaks and changes to support new um, and better support existing scientific priorities. This will include new, um, new microsurveys uh, that may be proposed on science topics that are not being considered as of now as particularly relevant for Rubin, uh, but they might become more relevant with time. And then of course, we are gonna be, we're gonna have to be able to respond to unexpected events in operations. So the ways in which we are thinking, uh, we will work with the community to continue uh, optimizing the survey strategy. We'll continue having liaisons into the science collaborations. Uh, that remains one of the best ways for us to get feedback on a diverse set of scientific cases. We will have an annual call for feedback. We we'll also have regular open portals or office hours where you can talk to us in between uh, the annual call for feedback if there is something more urgent that cannot wait for the next 12 or six months. Uh, we do commit on responding and reevaluating the survey strategy on an annual basis though. And then we will release, uh, the, the survey strategy team will release quarterly reports on the survey progress. So you can, you can check those and decide whether you want to come to us and ask us to change something. Um, quick snapshot, you've seen that part of the plot of this, um, you know, this um, cartoon timeline at the top in several um, of the other session, including the plenaries, that's the first year of the survey. Really the yellow bar is focusing on what the SCOC will do. Today we're on the left. Uh, by the end of the year, we should receive our, the reports from the Milky Way and, Uniform, and Uniformity Task Force. Uh, we'll evaluate them for a few months um, and incorporate those suggestions. In the spring, we expect the report from the Deep Drilling Fields Task Force. Uh, sometimes, like I said, either at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the summer, we'll have the, the Target of Opportunity Workshop and its recommendation will come in real time during the workshop. Um, and then the next bullet, the next point that you see is the end of 2024. 
Um, and at that point, we'll have commissioning information that we will be able to incorporate into the remaining decisions. During year one, um, we will have, um, uh, we will begin with our annual calls for feedback. And also we, um, in PSTN 055, we identified microsurveys to be run in year one, but we have not identified microsurvey to be run during the rest of the survey. Uh, that we did because we, are, we understand that we have a limited knowledge of the system, seen as the system is not really on sky yet. And so we were conservative in how much time we think we might have for microsurveys. And we only recommend it to begin with the ones that are really time sensitive. The ones that are really time sensitive are solar system surveys. We identify solar system surveys that will be severely impacted uh, by additional satellites. Uh, for the other microsurveys, we'll issue calls to reevaluate them and reevaluate them during, during um, the LSST, and we'll begin that um, in year one, setting up a call to decide what to do with microsurvey in year two. Um, I think I read everything that there was on this slide. Which brings me to the answer to a few questions, which Lynn and I are going to answer collaboratively because I some of them are yours. Uh, that we asked that were asked on Slido. We have set up a Slido for you to ask questions to us ahead of this session. It's been open for 10, 11 weeks. Um, and we've got a few questions. Uh, I think some of them were answered, the answer was incorporated in the talk. So these are the remaining ones. Um, and the first one is, can the SCLC commit to finalizing the remaining cadence decisions that do not require on-sky LSST CAM data uh, by December 2023? Um, I think I answered that. Uh, I, telling you, I told you how we are um, answering some right now and how we plan to answer the other ones. Do you want to do from there? To this. Okay. Uh, do you want to answer this? That's the solar system elongation. Uh, we got four questions from Slido. Let's go through those and then we'll begin with the Q and A. Okay. All right. Um, the the other the other question was that the near sun twilight survey. That's the same as the low solar elongation solar system twilight survey likely needs some optimization. Is this something that SEOC will look at in 2025? Um, obviously, we want to make the survey as useful as possible. And then we, so we would like to optimize these surveys, um, obviously within the box that we have available. Um, this one is a fairly small microsurvey. And so yes, there's probably a fair bit we can do to optimize it. Um, the SEOC plan is to take feedback yearly after operations start. So asking if this is something the SEOC will look at in 2025. I think this is one of those things that um, we likely have some optimization to do before we start the survey. And then as we start the survey and see how this is working, we probably have some more to do. So I think figuring out how we're going to do that with the community is something that, um, uh, and with the SEOC is something that we will, we don't necessarily have the full process written for. Um, but yes, yeah, so as, as, the, as the survey scheduling team, we anticipate at least some adjustments to this microsurvey during commissioning um, as we learn more about the system. Oh, and the, uh, the next one is mine too. Uh, are there notebooks that plot those various key metrics that the SUAC is using to evaluate the cadence comparing these baselines? And um, yes. They are a bit scattered in location for the particular differences between 3.0 and 3. Point, or sorry, yeah, between V3 and V3.2. Um, from V2 to V3, there were a lot of notebooks and they're all in the same place in the GitHub repo. But um, I actually thought this question was probably aimed more at the V3 versus 3.2 changes. Um, as an example of where one of these notebooks is, I, I did put in a link. But yes, it's it's true. We we do, we do have plans to improve how we're we're reporting and presenting some of these metrics and how they're changing between baseline simulations. Um, the the changes between three point zero and three point two were fairly limited, so we didn't necessarily make as big of a uh, 
effort to gather those up in the same way. And we apologize about that. And let me add that the question was asked on Slido probably yesterday. So, uh, you know, there was no action, no time to act on it. Um, and then, right, so there was a question about um, how will the SEOC membership change? Um, the current SEOC started in 2023. We had a turnaround of a number of members in 2023, so just at the beginning of this year. And uh, the appointments for the SEOC are two years. So with now mid-2025 expected start date, is the plan to have a new SEOC takeover in January 2025 during commissioning? Um, yes and no. We don't want people to have to be stuck on the SCOC for a decade because that's not fair to the SCOC members. And so the rotation on a two year basis will continue. We do expect some of the members to rotate out of the committee and some of the members to stay. So as we get new people, we'll also retain knowledge and be able to do knowledge transfer and continuity um, will be ensured by the members that stay on the committee. We, I think um, at the top of my head, there's five members that are on their second term. So I guess at, the, at a minimum, we expect, uh, oh, not at the top of my head, because I put it in the slack. Um, at a minimum, we expect them to rota rotate out for their own mental health. And that was it. We can move on to the live questions. <clears throat> Maybe on slide, um, um, there was something on Yes, sorry, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, there. Ming did have a question that relates to one of the Slido questions, which was about the cadence decisions and the timing. Yeah. Um, and she had asked if she can unmute. Um, I, do I, do I don't know if you need to do anything there or if she just unmutes. No, I can unmute. I just wanted, I, I think I'm more concerned about the timeline in terms of decisions. Um, 2020, assuming a mid 2025 start, which is even last year, I assumed there would be delays. My really big worry is, is this is the next year is the last year before data starts flowing. And so people are working on pipelines, people are writing NSF proposals, people are writing large observing proposals. And so we're now also, I guess the SEOC is expecting us to be making feedback as well. And I'm really worried about early science with what Jamie was showing, especially about in template generation. And so I really worry about that decision being, it seems like moved to the end of 2024, or even mid 24, 2024, same thing with the TOOs, because March is the timeline to be putting in these big proposals. So I worry that like, there's a lot of stuff the community has to be doing. And now we're possibly being asked to do much more by the SCOC without really necessarily knowing when. And so my worry is, is that, is that going to put more stress on the community than front loading some of that earlier, like making some simulations about different template scenarios, even if it's not going to be something that's feasible, so but that we can see now and do that in early January or February before we're totally overloaded to then understand and have much better expectations of what actually is going to happen in the first two months of LSSD. And so I just want to stress that point that I'm, I'm as wearing my co-chair hat, I'm really worried that, you know, November is when people are writing NSF proposals and I can see the next two years being the time people putting in that haven't because of the fear of not getting accepted when data is not flowing. Plus writing those big Gemini proposals, JWST proposals and testing their software and then people that are working on commissioning. So I'm not sure if the SEOC has fully thought that through or if this is something that can be further discussed with the science collaborations. But I just wanted to raise that because in my head, I've seen next year as being so busy with that stuff and not knowing what year one looks like in terms of actually what we get in the first three months by looking at template generation and things like that. I think that's that's where my concerns are coming. And so I'd love to hear what people in the room think um, and whether that's an ongoing, we can have an ongoing discussion to maybe change some of these timelines. Thank you. Um, I, I, there, there was a lot there. So I think we're going to give you pieces of the answer. Um, one of the things you mentioned is targets of opportunity. Uh, keep in mind that we have, uh, we're already working on how to enable them. We have an, uh, an, an envelope of the time that we'll spend on it. We're talking about how to implement the strategy internally. We also are not going to overlap with all five, with all fours. So like, you know, there's, I'm not worried about that decision um, not being able to converge in time. Um, the task forces that I've mentioned are already active. We have a number of members of the community that have uh, been 
I hope happily, perhaps regretfully, but you know, my perception is that they have happily volunteered to be on those task forces. And uh, so I'm not worried about those. So that mostly leaves us with year one. Mm -hmm. Some of the things, you know, um, we might be able to address with simulation, some we will not. So, so, so I, I think, I think that I might characterize some of the remaining questions beyond those that you've discussed as what does early science look like and what does, what does it look like as we're um, covering the sky for the first few times and do we have templates for that? Do we not? What does the data processing look like for that? And I'm going to hand it over to Leanne. And well, the antics, and that's why I want to emphasize that simulations are happening, actually. The, we saw a poster by Eric and mm -hmm. his student um, yeah. working on this. Yeah, I mean, I think simulations are a great idea. I know they've started, um, and this came up in the early science session yesterday, that we should start doing some, maybe some more simulations in, in year one uh, and using this. So that's a great idea, and that's happening, as you say. In terms of what early, what year one's going to look like, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, SCOC people, I think the only real open question is how we're going to be generating the templates. Um, because let's look at the data preview side, that's all data that comes out of commissioning. And that data is based upon uh, Keith's on sky test plan. Now that's still evolving and it, it's probably going to change because we don't know where we're going to land in commissioning yet. But the data previews will contain the, that data. And then let's say all that doesn't get done in commissioning and we end up doing some extra work in, in early ops, we're just going to continue with what's in Keith's on sky commissioning plan. So there won't be any changes there. But I know that's not really not what Meg's interested in. She's interested in the alerts and the, the time domain stuff. I just wanted to cover that for completeness. Um, so yeah, I think the open questions now are, um, what sort of data do we come out of commissioning with? And hence, what templates do we have at the beginning of the survey? That's really, we won't know that until we get into the SV surveys. And then there's incrementally generating the templates there's open questions around how often do we do this which visits do we take do we just take the first end visits and make the template immediately and then, or do we wait or do we apply criteria like ms quality these are all open questions and simulations will help um, with this and i think yes over the next year or so we have to do some work on this in the project i mean deciding how we build the templates um, is sort of, it's a project thing, but clearly we're going to work with the community to get the best answer in the SCOC. And I want to mention, you know, uh, like I mentioned, we have solicited input on template generation and early science in the past. I think since we have solicited that, in, in, that input that led to some papers, and white papers, we also have learned and decided a lot more what data will deliver, how it will deliver the alerts, et cetera. So uh, we do need new input and we need updated input on the basis of the decisions that have been made um, about year one on the technical side in between. Oh. Renee? Oh, sorry. 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 Um, just to follow up on that, um, I guess, um, is a overly simplistic summary of the concern, whether or not we spend in nights only doing templates after we have finished the on sky tests is that and again i'm not saying that you know is, is that a paraphrasing of your question meg or because i'm just not sure when we talk about how we make templates I, I think it's i think it's all of it right like i would ask is if there say you get some time back from switching to one to 30 seconds what happens if the scheduler was commanded to take templates Whereas there wasn't, or if it did spend two weeks making templates. And I and also what is actually the alert stream look like over the first two months? Because I hear people and myself included going, oh, I'm gonna get colors, I'm gonna get this. And we might not be. And I think I think we as a community don't necessarily fully understand what is the most likely scenario for what we're actually getting. Because we're so focused on what we get in 10 years. And so again, my concern is if there was a way to better optimize template generation in terms of the scheduler taking some time, or maybe that's not feasible, but then we as a community understand that, right? Or as you said, Renee, taking a month and doing template, maybe that, you know, so it, it, to me, it seems like it's that combination that we know in March, right, kind of what we're getting in the first few months of LSST. And right now I'm not 100% sure what we are, what we are getting. I know what we're getting in 10 years. I know what the data release looks like, but I'm not sure I know what the first three months, four months of Ruben look like in terms of what will be available, yeah, what so, will be so, detected. 
In terms of alerts, Meg, I think you're right. We don't yet know what the first three months of Ruben will look like. We don't, All right? That's clear. Let me just clarify something about templates. At the moment, there are two sources of templates in year one. One is the templates that come out of the commissioning data, which are available on day one. The other is incrementally generated templates. As we move through the survey, we observe a field in three, we have three pointings of a field, we make a template, and then the next time we go back to it, we can do a difference image and hence let out alerts. At this time, according to the, the, the baseline strategy and the plans, they are the only two sources of templates. So we don't know what the first three months will look like because we don't know what we're going to get out of commissioning and we haven't decided fully how we're going to execute incremental template generation. And in the first three months, we've still got to get to that point where we have three images in a field to combine. Even if we just take the first three, irrespective of quality, we still got to take those first three. So the first month or so, your first three months isn't going to have very much. Now to come to your other point, do we spend some time at the beginning of the survey collecting data to make templates in advance. We did raise this topic. We had this discussion at last year's PCW, maybe even the one before it came up, it was discussed a lot. We, we did float the idea a lot and we considered it in ops of a dedicated up to a maximum of three months dedicated template generation program. And our general feedback from the community was that this wasn't what they wanted. They, there, was, there was sort of confusion around this as to, well, if you do that, you're not executing the survey and then that delays the survey. So I'm not saying that this decision is finished and closed and we're happy to reconsider it and we will work with the SCOC. When, let me be clear, operations will not make any decision about the survey cadence that isn't in accordance with what the SCOC recommends. We will work together on all of this. So, I mean, we're happy to have this discussion again and we're happy to consider it. And I think simulations would really help us to put some numbers on it this time around. But there's pros and cons on this. You know, if you spend X amount of time executing a dedicated template generation program, that's X amount of time you're not executing the survey. So, yeah. Fair point. I just think is that the SEOC, there's space in the in-between between not spending a month and possibly yeah, having an have greedy that. algorithm doing that. So I, I just think it's something on the, the, SCOC, the, the, S, like. the SCOC may want to consider earlier if possible. Yeah, I will say, Meg, I, I really, really, I do think we need to look at some simulations and see what the SCOC decides what we should do. A really, really rough guess, I think they're going to wash out to be even. For the first 50 days or so, you, you either spend a month trying to get templates and then you can start trying to find things, and then it's about two months after you started. Or you wait those 50 days that Jamie's simulations, which, by the way, for those of you who missed um, the early science session yesterday, this is some work that um, my student, uh, Jamie, I forgot, Robinson, sorry. Yes, Jamie Robinson has been working on and um, basically shows a, a delay of about 50 days or so before you start finding solar system objects. So I think it's gonna be close to a rush, but we'll see, we'll see. We'll have to do some simulations to be sure. I just wanna say, I, that broke. yeah, I do think um, like if we wait, and tell the community like at next year's PCW what to expect that it's a little late in the funding proposal process. I think that is one of Meg's concerns. So we might want to be a little proactive about making sure we have kind of better expectations to give people a sense of like, you know, don't tell NSF that you're going to be active, actively analyzing solar system alerts like 10 days after the survey starts when you're putting in your November funding proposal. So I think we should keep the funding and observing proposal deadlines in mind and make sure we give people a heads up early enough for that. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a, that's a very fair point. And it's something that we have been trying collectively as Rubin organization, we've been trying to do more and more. We have not, we, we, you know, um, a lot of us are based in the US and we're familiar with the very regular NSF deadlines. There's many more proposals that people may want to apply for. So um, it, it even helps us if people in other communities and other countries tell us about their deadlines and we can help you craft a reasonable proposal at that point. Actually, sorry, there was a question earlier on Slack that um, Jay answered on Slack, but maybe you can, you can just repeat that to the people in the room all right so the question was on what time scale with things like additional cadence special issue papers be of use because there's the sec going to stop 
uh, accepting feedback. And I basically said, you, you're allowed to give us feedback in advance of your refereed paper. Absolutely, yes. And, you know, it takes time to turn what your feedback into a proper paper. So, yes, absolutely yes. give us feedback. Like some of the published papers are about versions of the baseline simulation we've now moved past. Yeah. And yet that was still important work. And it's been permanently recorded. And this paper is actually getting citations, too. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so Bryce and then, and then Michael, okay. since you're right there. And this might be solar system more. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so I was looking at the results from the Twilight Survey sim simulations, and it looked like I uh, had a plot that said that you got 0 0.4 completeness for ALOs with absolute magnitude 20 or brighter. And that's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. That's great work. Um, but my question is, uh, from what I understand, is that the Twilight Survey is only running in the morning? No, it's running evening and morning? Okay, okay. Well, I was going to say, um, are there certain times of the year where you could turn off the Twilight Survey for when the galaxy is in the direction where the Twilight Fields would be for that morning or evening section, depending on the time of the year? And could you use that time instead somewhere else in the survey, or even potentially do more twilight survey in one direction, avoiding the galaxy, and increase the completeness even more? I think those are great questions for us to optimize the, the near sun twilight survey as, as we go forward. And yeah, I, I actually, I kind of expect that in the first year, because of operational, you know, settling out operational things with the telescope, it's possible that we may need like the evening twilight for our setup or, or something. I'm not sure. So I, I do think that there's, we'll, we'll just have to be responsive to what's actually happening in operations. And let um, me add that um, some of the surveys like that one, that falls in the least coveted time as Peter suggested, right? So that doesn't impact so zero solar that probably won't impact any of the other science. So for those, there's definitely space for optimization. They're self-contained. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go to Michael here Michael, because he yes. has a question in a while. Uh, somewhat different subject. Um, uh, we will only learn during commissioning whether indeed we want to go with one times 30 seconds or two times 15. If it ends up being the former, we, in a sense, we get 7% um, yeah. uh, efficiency back. Yeah. So uh, are you running simulations both ways? So as it were, once you have a decision, you know which which branch to take or do you, uh, it, will we be surprised at this? So we in had effect? been in the past running simulations yeah. both ways. We are now, we're not, we're running the 3.2 simulations with two 15 second snaps. One important thing to think about is what Lynn was saying at the beginning. A number of observations on the on the white path deep footprint has gone down as the result of an optimization that leads to overall better science. But we're you know we're fairly low. We're above the requirements, so that's good. But we really can't don't have a lot of wiggle room there. So I think a conservative choice that we might lean toward is to if we just realize that we have extra 7% of the time, at least on the first year, not try to stack it with other projects that are not currently in scope, uh, but just try to use it to um, improve the white fast deep to give a little bit more time back to the white fast deep. And then as the survey cadence proceeds, we can reconsider that. Now I'm just gonna work backwards a bit. I have a question about uh, the TRO survey. Um, so 3%, um, is that plan to be uniform over the 10 year survey? Because we, we definitely expect the number of sources to go up yep. with time. No, and that's part of the recommendations that we want to hear from the community. Obviously, you know, if we're trying to respond to gravitational waves and there's no gravitational wave detections program running, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to distribute that time uniformly. At some point, uh, stacking the time in a small amount of time would really interfere with this, with other science that needs to be done. So it's balanced. And I see, Jay, do you want to add something? Just opt into your winning part because they're not actually stacked. Yeah. 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 Uh, you, you mentioned some concern about uh, satellite trails and detectability of solar system objects, I think, in, in the mini surveys. Uh, can, can you say a little bit more about how you assess that, what software you use to, to, to test whether objects will be detected or not? 
So I can't, but I think Lynn and Peter probably can. But my comment was fairly high level, right? So if we expect that the population of satellites will increase significantly, there is a risk that some of the solar system microsurveys will become harder and harder. Um, so it makes sense to prioritize them. And that was the consideration that was made by the SCOC um, to decide about the first year um, it, toilet survey. It's worth noting these are the, the observations that are right towards the sun yeah. during twilight. That's, that's the only part where that's weighing in. So it's more of a risk, uh, of, it was more of a risk assessment that is simulation driven recommendation to be fair. Uh, you need a microphone. Yeah, so, you need a microphone. So, Peter. Well, they come on back up here. Yeah. <laughs> So last year I had a student who simulated a 30,000 satellite Starlink mega constellation and even for twilight observations, uh, you lose less than 1% of your pixels. So we, don't worry about satellites. I'm very encouraged to hear that maybe we don't have to worry about satellites in twilight. Um, so I was just going to ask about the juxtaposition of two things that we've heard. So one, the twilight surveys are going to be prioritized early because the count of satellites is likely to go up over time. And two, we, we won't have templates early. Um, so is that, is that a problem? Do we need templates for the twilight surveys? Yeah, to be honest, that was... That I, I had forgotten when I was answering Bryce's question about do we only do the twilight in the morning or the evening, but I think that is actually something we want to consider like is this a part of the sky we've already seen. Uh, and so we can have a template for it, but yeah I, I especially for your one for the. We need to look at like how we're scheduling that I think so let me be clear um, there were about I don't remember Jay how many 10 mini micro survey that had been proposed that we were evaluating. Really, none of them had made a very strong case for which it had to be started at the beginning of LSST. The only consideration that we had on that was, is there a risk for this survey if the satellite population grows in ways that we might not even expect? Because there's a lot of uncertainty over that. And we assessed that that was a risk. And therefore, if we prioritize a survey, it should be that one. We also wanted to keep, be very conservative and make sure that we weren't selling more time that we're going to end up having. So that's the only survey that we have recommended strictly to start um, in year one. And Jay was actually leading that task force. Yeah, so, uh, uh. <laughs> yes, so all the reasoning behind the decisions are in the document, so, of course. Um, which is publicly available. But the, the NEO toilet survey was also the most scientifically compelling of all of the surveys. So, and so we set up several reasons for making the recommendations and so the risk of of, of our artificial satellites was only a small part of the decision for making it the recommendation for that to be the the only one we we're going to go the main issues is we don't have know how much time we have for micro surveys so that's why we're, we were deliberately conservative in our choices um Mario, is this a follow-up with this okay yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, you're kind of confirming my intuition about satellites, um, but I just want to encourage this this group, the ICOC, to to tightly couple with the, with DM, especially if you have questions about, you know, will we be able to detect these objects without templates or, or with templates or in this quality of their data. Um, we, like solar system group is a fairly small one, like it's that person over there and this person over here. So do feel free to talk to us about what the software can do, because um, I mean, we, we have a lot of um, knobs we can turn. Definitely, thank you. Okay, Igor. Igor. Thank you. So disclaimer, I uh, stepped in a few minutes later. I hope uh, this is not redundant. But I'm curious uh, still about the matter of 30 second exposure, two times 15. Where are we at with considering hybrid options? Uh, in terms of proposals, in terms of simulations, um, you know, for example, uh, having a different strategy for the galactic plane or high galactic uh, latitudes, or for example, dedicating one or two years to snaps to open a new parameter space so the heat is not 7%, but 0.7 or 1%. 
uh, but still keep high efficiency in the detection rate of, for example, uh, slow fast, uh, slow extragalactic transients. Uh, I don't know who you're pointing back. Oh, I, was, I was just saying, I think you can answer the, the, the SEOC part, but we might have a comment from the end about the technical aspects. Yeah, from the SEOC perspective, to be honest, I do not want to spend a lot of time on this, given that we don't know if we technically can go to one to 30 seconds, uh, just because we like everybody else in the Rubin ecosystem and possibly in the world are significantly oversubscribed. And we, um, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on something that might turn out uh, to be entirely an academic exercise. As a personal answer, I think hybrid options are definitely something that we're gonna to wanna to consider if we can go to one to 30 seconds. There might be some compelling reason to keep some two to 15 seconds exposures. That is a discussion that we have not had with the observatory. Yeah, um, so from the data management side, we're not thinking that this is something that's going to, that, that we're going to be doing, mainly because we haven't been asked to do it. We haven't thought that was on our agenda. So it's the current baseline is two by 15. Um, we will decide during commissioning, as you've already said, whether we go to one by 30 or not. Um, I think we'd want to see good, solid science reasons for doing this because it will be extra work. Yeah. We will have to implement a system that can either do one by 30 or two by 15, depending upon whatever parameters it is that drives that decision. And then we have to store that information. We will need provenance. We will need to make it available through all our catalogs, the consolidated database, the butler, everything else that goes with the, the metadata, the image metadata to say, to, to, to store that sort of information. So this is not something we've considered it is not zero work um and i think before i would give it any more thought i'd want to see some solid science drivers for it yep so it goes let's figure out if we can do 130 let's figure out what are the science drivers for both let's figure out and make and pick one let's figure out if there is very compelling science that can be enabled um by what you call the hybrid and it may be worth pointing out that Getting the information from the separate snaps, I think, is an extra expansion. Yeah. I mean, irrespective oh, yeah. of whether it's one by 30 or two by 15, a visit is a 30 second visit. And that's what people get in their raw images. And that's what people get as part of the, the PVIs, the process visit images. That is the calibrated visit images, single epoch visit images that you will work with as scientists. Um, so that's another question. Are we going to keep the snaps and make them available? That is not currently in our plan. Yeah, that was, and, and that, that's true, whether or not it's one by 30, two by 15 or hybrid. Um, if you wanna get something out of the two by 15, that would have to be something that you do independently on a, um, on a specific pipeline that you design, not the observatory. The, the one exception is U-band. There has been a decision made to do one by 30 second for the U-band. Thank you. Because of the read noise. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, that's correct. Just sort of the DM side of things. We haven't actually implemented two by 15 snaps yet because we know there's a strong possibility we'll go to one by 30. And so we don't want to invest time in developing that system if we don't need to. So we're waiting to see what happens in commissioning. It is not a tall pole. We know how to do it if we have to, but just there's other tall poles for us to climb before we get to that one. That's all. So you're right, one by 30 has been chosen for you, Bond. And if the whole sky goes to one by 30, that is really easy for us. If the whole, if we don't go to one by 30, then we have to come back to this issue anyway. So then maybe we can have a discussion about something like hybrid but I still want to see a compelling science driver. <laughs> wow, I think we worked through all of the work. First one, oh, Nian's got a question. I have, I have a question. Go back to slide 38, Fed. As, as if there's nothing else, this is a sort of small point. We did. 38. Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah, I want to screen share it. So please ask on. Okay. Um, no, it's it's actually just as a mistake. That's all. Mm -hmm. You have got start plus six months DR1. It's start plus six months DP2 comes out, and start plus one year is DR1. Ah, oh, so we're not supposed to be the release time, but, uh, uh, yes. No, no, you're you're quite right. That's very confusing. Yeah. I put I wrote those down, and I was like, this is the data that you get up to this point. Like, so that's yeah. like that's when the data taking is the end of it um you're right that is not when that's released to the community right so for clarity um 
oh, and there's a typo apparently somewhere, uh, for clarity, uh, the period between the survey start and the year one is the data that goes in the year one, there's a delay in the release. We definitely should change that because that's like the wrong people. Yeah, you're okay. right, yeah, you're right. And we need to be consistent yeah, with. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you, that's a good idea. And there's a typo which I will figure out. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, any other questions around yeah. the room? Uh, let me let me check if there are any more on site. Uh, I did I make did correctly. I, I may put a link to Jamie's presentation in the Slack channel, and she did point out he's a early career researcher um, with her. Yeah, which which oh great, you got it in the notes. Excellent, Renee. Uh, we should thank Renee for yeah, taking some Renee excellent notes. notes. Thank you. Thank excellent. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we can wait a few minutes, see if there's any yeah. more questions, or we can let people go get yeah. coffee yeah. a few minutes or yeah. Question, here you go. So I have a question about the snaps. If we have a fast moving near Earth asteroid that's leaving a 30 pixel streak uh, on this on the snaps, then do we how do we, how do we handle that? That sounds I mean, like it, a data management. Like question. it would be a it would be a it would look like a cosmic ray, right? It would look like oh, let's get rid of this. It's not real because it's not in the same place. Only it, it is real. I, actually, I saw Alex back here. Yeah, it would okay. It was a mistake. No, I mean, I mean, it's a good question. How do we handle it? It, it just wouldn't look like a cosmic ray. That's that's all I'm saying. Uh, Alex has been doing quite a bit of work with. Uh, the, sorry, you, you work with, with a lot of the image simulations as far as this goes, right? As as my understanding is. For, for, DCAM. for DCAM. Okay, sorry, that's based on that DCAM experience. Thank you. Yeah, just I agree with Alex. Um, it won't look like a cosmic ray, but also we're not, we're pretty certain we're not going to be using snaps to remove cosmic rays anyway. We have a morphological cosmic ray algorithm that's in the pipelines at the moment. So I don't think this is an issue. Sorry, just for clarification, does that mean that you'll see it as two streaks and it'll appear twice in the image, basically? Um, will it depend, like if we're doing, so so with snaps, there's a lot of details that uh, I I am not clear on the details of because I'm not in data management. Um, I think it's fair to say that. Uh, I mean, if the image is a collab. Yeah, like well, but it's not the images, but it's the, the collab, the catalogs was the original plan, at least that I read. Of course, this is a long time ago that I read any of it. So I think that that's a question for for data management question, people. Uh, for, if you have further questions about that, but and Mario has his end up. Do you have any insights? More? Would any of you like to ask a question? Okay. Um, all right. Well, Mario had another question. No, sorry, shut, shut me down if this is too much on a tangent, but if uh, if we don't need snaps for cosmic ray rejections, what is the science case for having them? Oh. Do you want to answer that, Fred, or so, should, uh, should I, we talk I mean, to... Yeah. Okay, cool. There are science cases, right? So there's like, the, the, the most obvious thing is the difference in saturation limit, but currently the problem is that what we're evaluating is not really like, are we comparing the science throughput with the ability to remove snaps. So th the question that we have right now is, can we technically go to one times 30 seconds in 10 in terms of uh, cosmic wave removal as well as calibration and everything else? Yeah. And Mario, perhaps I spoke too definitively. We do have to test our strategies for cosmic ray removal and commissioning. Okay, so we can't definitively say that we're not gonna use them yet, but I think everyone's sort of feeling that's the way it's going. Yeah, but we have to wait for commissioning. But once that is settled, the SCOC wants to ask the community, is there a science case that we are missing? Is there, what, what is the consequence of changing the saturation limit of the images? And we will take into consideration, it's gonna be 
uh, you know, a strong, a hard battle against a 7% increase in efficiency. Yeah. And uh, I will there mention- There are some science cases actually that have to do like with white doors and planets and things like that, and really rapid stuff that might require, um, that would require um, design pipeline, a customer design pipelines, et cetera. But we do, we have received some science cases over the history of the SCLC on the benefits of two of them. So let, let me express a little bit of a concern with that plan, which is that, my guess is we'll know the answer to, to, to Leanne's question fairly late in the game, perhaps a year and a half from now. So at that point, I think we want to pull the trigger very, very quickly. And this will not be a good time to do a wide uh, community consultation. No. So I think this decision probably be good to be made as early as possible. Sorry, perhaps I misspoke. I don't, I'm not saying we're going to then issue a call to tell us why we should still do two times 15, even though one times 30 is. Um, is available. We do have science inputs we have received over the course of the white papers and the cadence notes, a few submissions that have scientific motivations for the two times 15. And, and I will point out, so one of the PSTNs, uh, 053, I believe, actually does say like we can't make this decision now, we have to wait until it's proven technically feasible. But if we have the choice, we would like to go with one by 30. So then the question might be after operations start, is there, do we hear feedback from the community that maybe SNAPs would be useful, at least in some part of the sky? So, so th thank you for, for um, mentioning that because that's where my confusion kind of arises. I thought that this was already settled, but from the science point of view, that document argues that we want 30. And if we, from technical perspective, cannot filter out cosmic rays, we would go to two times 15. But and I seem to be hearing something different from, from Fed. So can, can so you comment on that? Never we have decided that if technically possible, it's definitely for sure that scientifically it's best to go times one, one times 30. The statement is, um, it seems compelling and it seems um, that the 7% increase in efficiency is the most compelling case. Scientifically it does have the most compelling benefits. I'm not saying that this is something that we cannot decide now. I'm saying that this is something that I think we can decide quickly and we will decide it quickly once we know it's possible. We're working on other decisions right now so we can't decide all at once, just we don't have personal power to do that. I'm not expecting it's in, that we, but not that we will definitely. It's in PSDN 053 that it is likely that we will. So I just, I just want to paraphrase because now I thought I understood, then I was confused, then I thought I understood, now I'm confused again. So I just, so the question is, if the decision was that one time study is preferred, if we can't do it, we'll do two times 15, that at least, um, that's one way, right? If the argument is there may be cases, scientific cases that want either a hybrid or two times 15, I think Mario's point is well taken that we can't um, make that decision only once we know, because then that's really, we have to make that decision quickly. And I fully appreciate that you don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time evaluating up, uh, uh, simulations, knowing that it may be a moot point, but at the same time, we're to catch 22, that either we don't make the decision now um, and we have to do it really, really quickly, or we do make the decision now, and then maybe there are science cases that we So must. let me clarify the process. We have the material to make the decision, but the SCSC works by getting together, talking and making consensus recommendations with the committee. We haven't done that. We're making consensus recommendations on other things. I don't think this is gonna be something that is gonna be contentious. I don't think this is gonna be something that is gonna be hard to converge. We will get to that, we'll get to that in time. We're not prioritizing it over other decisions that have to be made to continue implementing survey strategy simulations uh, that have uh, you know, more mm, dif different impact on different science metrics. So we have open yeah. Yes. We have three minutes left. As I understood it, we're not going to get to keep the two times 15 seconds, right? So doesn't that kill many of the science cases for having them? like rapid variability, you would not um, so have the individual exposures. So we keep the 15, two times 15 seconds, we don't process them separately. So they're available to the community uh, eventually. <laughs> the they answer are. could be your face. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. I, my, my understanding is that change because, okay. Think 
I think this is clearly an area we have to, uh, there's a question, but I, I believe that part of the part of the answer was that because they were catalogs which were compared, basically co-added, that you could have essentially come up with a difference in flux between the two 15 second observations and then add that to the schema. Adding, adding fields possibly based on an internal analysis of two 15 second snaps is not the same as making the images available. All right, that's, um, let, listen, let me check on this. I did not think we were making these available, but I now you've, you've so in the I right down in my mind now. In the right paper call from uh, 2018, there was a statement that keep in mind that if you uh, wanna use the two times 15 seconds, you will need to build custom made pipelines. That's what I was basing my understanding of the fact that they exist based on the fact that we, we made that clear. Yes. We have two minutes, Natasha. All right. Um, hi, I have a very different question um, with regard to the annual review of the cadence. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, how um, much do you anticipate it to change year to year? Like, is the footprint mostly set in stone, but like uh, things might change? Yeah, it seemed a little vague. Thanks. Uh, well, it is vague because, like I said, we will we're, we're, with that, we plan to use the annual review to respond to unknowns. So I can't tell you how it will change until I know the unknowns, right? So, you know, uh, it, the process will work very much the same. If you think that there is an emerging scientific case, or if you think that the survey strategy as is, is failing to meet one of the scientific goals, you will tell us how to measure the impact on that. Maps will continue to exist on simulation. They will exist on existing, actually um, exist real um, catalogs of observations and we'll run them, we'll evaluate the scientific impact and we'll evaluate changes at that point. One thing that is true is that, you know, we do have a 10 year survey. So some things will, the, 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 the way in which you can change things will sort of like narrow down as you go forward to achieve the scientific goals that we had to achieve the number of images on the wide pass deep, the depth, et cetera. Yeah, so at we, some point we we'll get like, yeah. So at some point we'll get to the bottleneck where we can't change anything because there's like a month of survey left and it's just gonna be that. It is 3.30. I think we've answered yes. a lot of questions. Um, thank you everybody. Yes, thank you all for coming.